Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 FM in gorgeous, wonderful, fabulous Nanaimo and on Vancouver Island. We are so glad that you have tuned in today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kathy Holmes, and I'm very, very happy to be your host. In the Zoom booth with me today is Jane Osborne. Jane is so well known in the Nanaimo community and actually all over Vancouver Island for her work with the CRN. Welcome to the program, Jane. How are you? Thank you so much, Kathy. I am just terrific at the moment, enjoying our wonderful Nanaimo environment and the Central Island. Are we lucky? We really live in the best place on earth. At least that's what I do. So yeah. for those of you who are listening, by the way, if you do hear some noises in the background, remembering that this is a Zoom call, there may be some distraction sounds. Those being, you know, Kevin and Bobby Wilson, my dog's barking, looking for treats and cookies. They will bark if the wind is blowing. They will bark if the postman comes by. So not to worry if you hear sirens or anything like that. It is part of the, part of the, I guess, the genre at this point of working on Zoom. So Jane, could you please unpack for us what exactly is the CRN or the BCCRN as I know it? That's quite, that's quite an involved question, so I'll try to keep it simple. But CRN is just stands for Community Response Network. And what we are about is trying to prevent uh, abuse or intervene early in abuse, neglect, and self-neglect of adults, of anybody from the age of 19 and uh, to the grade. So to do that, we need to be present in a lot of different uh, places in the province. And in fact, we have more than 80, I don't know what the last count was, it's probably in excess of 90 now, community response networks around the province. And they are very varied, it really depends on the community. So they will range from groups of community agencies and professionals along with some individuals to some that are almost wholly constituted of individual people in community that want to make a difference, that want to see their elders or seniors are safe, that are also concerned about the broad, uh, broad, uh, I'm not sure the right word, but the diversity of people who may be at risk of abuse and neglect. Absolutely. And, and I know that in our community, there has been the focus on looking after older adults in particular, but to recognize that it's more than just older adults, it's anybody over the age of 19 years old who may, as you said, be subject potentially to some form of abuse um, and, or self-neglect. And I, I guess one of the things that I'm curious about, when you talk about how it's different in every community, who comes to the table actually to talk about this? And and what does it mean to help be impactful in the community? Once again, quite a diversity of people. So a number of the community response networks here in the Central and North Island, and my uh, region goes from the Malahat to the tip of the island up to the West Coast. Uh, it is often uh, folks that are associated with community, uh, community agencies, uh, with individuals who are members of a community health network uh, and are interested they volunteer, primarily volunteers, and we also get folks from the health system. That was, of course, before COVID-19, although I was at a meeting just last, oh, what, Thursday night, I guess it was, Kathy, with the Cowich and Valley folks, and we actually had three or four people from um, uh, Vancouver Island Health and from the Divisions of Family Practice, uh, you know, and they, that was great because we were able to look at the impacts of COVID-19 from both sides, from that of the service or uh, provider of services to the folks that are receiving service. So it's all of those people. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm quite concerned uh, about what might be happening behind closed doors in people's homes, particularly during COVID-19. Can you give us a little bit of insight? Has there been an increase uh, of abusive situations as we know it? There has been. There is data actually showing, uh, showing an increase. There's an increase in domestic violence. Uh, and you know, people often think that that stuff doesn't happen to older adults or seniors, but yes, it does. And I think that any time uh, our, our sort of communal anxiety starts to go up, uh, we become less capable of sort of managing ourselves and and as a consequence of that, we do see an increase. And we're seeing it right across the, uh, right across the demographic. 
the interesting thing about it is that we're not seeing go, people go to the usual places. So for example, when this first started, the people that work in, in the domestic violence sector were not seeing an increase of people coming to their shelters, primarily because people were frightened. Of so course. they were choosing to stay home. Yes. Yes. And, and the difficulty with that is because if a person doesn't feel safe in going out and it perpetuates what's happening in their own home, that living environment can become even more toxic, even more dangerous. You know, if somebody finds themselves in an abusive situation, there's a number of things that happen from the beginning. It, it takes, first of all, quite a while for a person to even admit that they are in an abusive home uh, or an adversive, uh, abusive environment. World Elder Abuse Awareness Day is usually the 15th of June every year. And uh, yes, for those of you who cannot see, there's a big poster up at the back of, because uh, uh, this is a radio broadcast to start with. <laughs> Although you may find it on Act 3 television on Shaw Spotlight coming up soon. Um, but World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, it's, it's a very important day for people to understand in, from a training aspect of what abuse could look like. Because most people, not most, many people will not necessarily self-identify as being abused, right? It's their children uh, who may be uh, financially uh, taking advantage or maybe behaving in ways that, you know, a mom or dad might say, well, you know, it's just my kids, it's just my kids. But in actual fact, there's a lot of people that are really being taken advantage of and particularly during this time. What would you say to that? How could you speak to that, Joe, or Jane? Another broad question. Thank you, Kathy. I can. Uh, I think that one of the things that really plays into this is that we are all raised in, in different environments. We have different backgrounds. And I know when I first came into this work, I did not recognize that I grew up in a very abusive um, household. So the, how, what did that look like? It looked like a lot of drugs and alcohol uh, were consumed, a lot of yelling, screaming, and uh, raging, and that was normal, right? And I can always remember the mantra in our household is, you know, never, you know, never tell anyone outside what's happening here. This is private, this is our family. And, and I think a lot of us really internalize that message because we don't even want to see it in other people's families. Right? Absolutely. We can, you know, we can see something and hear something and think that's not right. But at the same time, that's not my business. It's private to that family. So it's a cultural thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I come from the same family dynamics of, and not, and my mother wasn't, it wasn't alcohol or drugs or anything like that in my growing up, but for the framework, what happens in these closed doors remains behind these closed doors. My mother, bless her heart, uh, didn't realize that she was even being verbally abusive at the time. It was, you know, frustration of raising three kids by herself. So, you know, you, you can see where a, where a family might not even necessarily see abuse until much later on, you know, in their adult life when they see something that looks very different than their home environment, right? And, and how do we help support people that may suddenly have this awareness that, wow, maybe there was more abuse in my life than I'm willing to acknowledge and to stop it so that it doesn't perpetuate with future generations. Great question. There are a number of pieces to that. Here in BC, we have something called adult guardianship legislation, which is a very complex uh, thing that I will not try to describe in any detail. Understood. What, it's complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, uh, what I will say about it, it is that basically the fundamentals of the legislation are that everyone is free it should be free to live a life which, without abuse, neglect, or self-neglect. Right? We should have the we should have the freedom to make our own choices in life. So we also should not have to fit into someone else's idea of what is the right thing to do. Uh, it's a legislation based on principles, which I really like. And the most important piece of it is that, however we respond, we need to ensure that the person that we're responding to, uh, the, the, um, the adult, is the person in the driver's seat, so to speak. That it's up to them to make their decisions as long as they aren't making decisions that they can't make in their own best interest. 
So that's a very complex thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, but it, it, it more than that is that, you know, very often when we are dealing with mental health issues or we are, you know, working with people that may have a brain injury or may have uh, chronic uh, conditions that are associated from maybe them not taking drugs, but maybe their parents taking drugs and therefore it's gone into the physiological side of their, their growth and their potential. So, so the, it, I mean, it, it makes that conversation very difficult for people to, to go in and seek the help. So how can the CRN help? How, let's say I am aware of someone on my block, for example, that may be, in my opinion, based on what I've seen, you know, subject to potential abuse. What would I do as a community member? That's part of what the CRN is about, is letting you know in your community who you would go to, to seek advice and consult. And I think the important uh, piece of this is that while our legislation provides a number of responding agencies, and they are the health authorities, uh, Community Living BC, we're talking adults, uh, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and the public guardian and trustee to do with financial and estate matters, uh, and police are often at the front lines, so they may be the people who initially see it. It provides those formal responses, and that's like a backstop. Mm -hmm. It's like any legislation, it's a backstop. So around that table, though, will be groups of people, and as you well know, that will probably include uh, you know, people from Better at Home who are providing services and uh, are coordinating volunteers uh, mm -hmm. to to provide services uh, at home. It could, you know, there's any, the possibilities are infinite. There, you know, just depends once again on the community. So we have all these folks around the table that you uh, can tap into for a consultation. So I have received, you know, referrals from, you know, as far from uh, Port Hardy around something happening here in Nanaimo. And for me, so I'm somebody that you can consult with. I do not provide responses, but I will link, provide linking services. So I will listen to the story. And then before I take any precipitate action, I will usually consult. So I'll reach out to the people sitting at that community response network table and say, here's what I'm hearing. You know, have you heard similar things? Is there any sort of collaborative um, evidence here for whatever it might be, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the reason I do that and consult with the folks at the table, and some of them may include, you know, formal responders, I do that before I make a report. Because once you make a report, you trigger a response. Absolutely. And yeah. And the response means somebody is going to uh, have to follow up and take, uh, take some sort of action to assess the situation. Right? So that's like what the Community Response Network is about. It's about linking people uh, from various walks and rules of life. It's also about, so that's the responding piece, but more important than that in a way is an education piece. Like how do we educate people to recognize that this, you know, may be a situation that uh, is abusive uh, or neglectful, or even recognize self-neglect, which is a little easier. And in fact, I'll throw a stat at you right now, is that probably over 90% of the referrals that go to the health authority uh, are about people who are self-neglecting. So potentially, uh, you know, an isolated um, uh, senior still living at home and definitely wanting to maintain independence, but no longer having capacity, right? So once I refer that to the, uh, the agency, the Island Health, what happens is somebody will go in and assess that capacity. And if it happened to be, you know, my neighbor, they're probably going to guess that it was me that made the referral, which may not make for a good, you know, uh, a good future relationship. So what we try to do is say, hey, what do you think about maybe better at home can help you out and support you by, you know, providing whatever. Right. And that's what we try to do. Yeah, absolutely. And part of it, you know, and I think that pardon my language on this, but the, the content of thinking on somebody, you know, the old fashioned telling on someone, there's a lot of fear that's associated with people having their business out in public. And so what we have to understand is this, particularly when it comes to self neglect, is that, you know, kindness can be painful in the beginning, but at the end of the day, it is the most important thing that we can do for another member of the human race. And so being human, being a good human, 
human means that we do whatever we can as we can in the capacity that we can to support someone who may not be able to support themselves uh, at that time. And so, and I, I agree with you. I think it's very, very important that we recognize that we're not wanting to tell on somebody. We're wanting to support someone who may not be able to support themselves in one in one form or another. Hey, listen to everybody. If you've just tuned in, you've tuned into Act Three on CHLY 101.7. I'm Kathy Hone. Holmes, I call myself something, Kathy Hoes, actually. I don't know how I called myself Kathy Hoes. I'm really good at screwing <laughs> up other people's names, but the other day I called myself Kathy Hoes, if you can imagine. I'm Kathy Holmes, and in the booth with me is Jane Osborne from the BCCRN. Jane, I'm curious, um, what got you to start this work? Was it part of, you know, you, I mean, this has been a passion for you for as long as I've known you, and I've known you for almost, I don't know, six or eight years now. So what has brought you to this table? I mean, you sit at a lot of tables for CRN discussions. That's true. And I actually got involved, uh, you know, in this work, really through my, my realization that I should not be in the technology field, right? <laughs> so when I left technology, <laughs> I thought, well, what am I going to do? Right? And I thought, okay, I'm really interested in restorative justice and conflict resolution. So I started initially volunteering with the North Shore Restorative Justice on the mainland. And then I did some work for North Shore Restorative Justice. I was also doing some consulting work with uh, uh, various other folks like the Museum of Anthropology, which, which oriented me towards you know, people and humans and what happens with humans in interacting with uh, anything, including the technology I had once been designing that wasn't very good. So that's really how it all started, Kathy. Uh, and so you, then, I never would have expected technology to have been part of the conversation ever. I can see you maybe doing social work in the past or working for the health authorities, one of them within the province or somewhere back east. Tech would never have been my thought for where you had left a career to move into a different career. Isn't that interesting? It's frightening. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially these days, the way, I mean, the good news about tech right now is that we are able to meet via Zoom. And, you know, 10 years ago, this would not have happened. Five years ago, this would not have happened. So to me, technology certainly has its place. There's some positives with it. But yeah, I'm not tech savvy at all. Not at all. It's two of us. I don't even want to be. So, <laughs> so that's how it all started, Kathy. I got interested and in actual fact, I sort of, you know, turned in the wrong direction when I went to university. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I only knew what I didn't want to do. And that's how I wound up in the wrong field. Uh, but having discovered, you know, this, this, you know, these other ways of being, and particularly restorative justice, which is all about how to have conversations and uh, be authentic and learning, you know, communication skills. Uh, what I found is that having done that, when a situation arose for a friend of mine uh, who, whose, whose uh, mother had been pushed down the stairs by her father. Oh, wow. Uh, and interestingly enough, it all started over here on the island, and we were both living in North Van, and, and her father wound up in um, a jail cell, and her mother wound up in the neurology ward at uh, Lionsgate. And she called me and said, oh, my God, you know, what do I do? Where do I go? What? And I thought, I don't know. I've been out here working in the community sector now for you know, several years, and I have no idea. And that caused me to start to look around, and I stumbled into the North Shore Community Response Network. And I joined that table, and I can remember sitting around that table with a very dear friend of mine who's no longer living, Dolly Cartwright. And Dolly was in her 80s, and I'm this you know, relatively youthful 50 some odd. <laughs> Yeah, that was a while ago, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what do you say? Uh, and we worked together. But you know, we were very um, we were very engaged with people. And what I liked about Dolly is everything took place around her dining room table. So we would meet around her Dolly uh, dining room table, and she was completely open. And from Dolly, I learned so much about what to do and where to go. And then, of course, from the from the training I then took as a part of the Community Response Network. Incredible. And how long have you been with the CRN now? It's been a week. while. Mm. Oh, yes. Uh, since uh, formally with BCCRN, uh, 
you know, would be about 2005, but involved with this work since about uh, pre-2000, pre the first, um, first uh, tranche, tranche, whatever that means, like a slice of bread, I guess, of uh, legislation uh, coming into being, which was 2001. So I've been engaged, you know, pretty well through the history of, um, of CRN here in, um, in BC. With everything that's been happening in Canada and the United States, and racism now becoming at the forefront, finally, once again, for us to talk about and for us to find solution for. Has there been an uptake as it relates to the CRN and the work of equality? Absolutely. Um, in my own agency, we have had a tremendous focus on, um, and I'm gonna talk about that first, but I'll move quickly to around the province. Uh, mm -hmm. tremendous focus on how to be less colonial, how to become more diverse, how to be more inclusive, how to be in affirming of all human beings and whatever their identities might be. And you know what, Kathy, that's a really difficult process. I'm currently engaged in a uh, something called the 21 Day Racial Equity Challenge out of the uh, Michigan Public School of uh, uh, I've forgotten the name, of course. Uh, it, it's a big alphabet suit name. And it's been fascinating to me to realize that I'm a racist. Interesting. Interesting. I am very white appearing and I'm sixth generation Canadian on my father's side. You know, you know I'm just realizing I'm a racist. And, and I'll be honest with you, I completely hear what you're saying because I have taught my son not to be racist. I have grown up in the belief system that we are the same. And from coming from that, I've learned that I too am racist. And it's partially because of the dialogue that has been acceptable dialogue for years. And what might that look like? What, what is it, how is it manifested in you, Jane? Well, I think it's manifested more than anything else by a complete tone deafness or a lack of visual capacity to understand my own privilege. You know, uh, being a white person and not just a white person, you know, a, a settler, you know, sixth generation here in North America, uh, much has accrued to me because of that. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about it is really understanding that because I think each of us likes to look at some of the bad things that happen in our lives and think, well, we're better than this. You know, we're good people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not, we don't treat people badly, whatever our rationale might be. But that's not really understanding the whole issue around uh, privilege, right, and white privilege. So I hear what so you're saying, Jane. And I, I, the, the piece of it for me is, and I think that this is common for a lot of people, I know it certainly, and this is how I learned that I was racist in this regard, is I, for years, I would say, you know, I, I follow the Indigo Girls, sorry, I love the Indigo Girls, and they have one song that says, how long till my, uh, how long till my soul gets it right? And it's, uh, the, the, behind the scenes part of the song really talks about paying for the mistakes that my forefathers and forefathers and forefathers made. And for how long do I have to keep paying for that mistake? I know that with uh, the First Nations dialogues that we've had over the years, I've attended many reconciliation tables uh, and been really a part of the Indigenous relations piece. And at the end of the day, what my, my learning was, how come I'm still having to pay for the stuff that my parents did? They did it. I didn't do it. And then again, it comes back to that white privilege. Okay, so maybe I didn't do it, but my non-ability to understand the reality of what people have gone through has actually accelerated the problem, not, or and if not accelerated, certainly stabilized it. It hasn't made impactful change. Yeah, true. And I mean, I think that's the whole point is that uh, in order to change, we have to fully really dive deep into who we are as individuals, um, understand all those aspects of white privilege and understand that this isn't a binary world. You know, uh, there aren't good people and bad people. There are, you know, different people Absolutely. Uh, with different backgrounds, different identities, different, uh, different everything. Um, and the fact that I went to schools of privilege, like when I grew up, I grew up in Quebec uh, in, when I was in a grade in public school, and uh, I was a privileged person. I was white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, uh, you know, English speaking. 
in the midst of a province that wasn't. And we were privileged. There's no doubt about it. We lived in the more affluent uh, neighborhood. So I would take that analogy and put it into almost any other situation where I have been privileged. And I've been privileged going to school, privileged going to university, privileged, you know, to not live in poverty, and I can go on and on and on and on. And it's hard not to just look at that as the way the world is mm -hmm. and think somehow or other I earned that. I didn't earn that. <laughs> it was uh, it was a large complex of factors uh, that uh, that placed me in that world, uh, and I needed to learn that that just because other people were in that world didn't mean that they had earned whatever difficult stuff they might be faced with. No, to and the contrary. I, I think I mean I grew up very different than you did, Jane. I did not grow up in privilege as the defines are. I did not grow up in wealth. I grew up very, very poor. I uh, grew up single parent family. I, we had very little in the way of means. I did not get to go to university the way normal university students did. That came way later in life. All of the things that happened happened, you know, education wise, much, much later. But that but that piece that is the assumption that because you were white you are privileged is also very confusing for people because it's the definition of privilege is that is what gets in the way, right? And privilege doesn't necessarily mean socioeconomic state, right? It just doesn't. It may be, I'm very privileged as a white chick, but that doesn't necessarily mean I grew up privileged, right? But I'm privileged being that I'm white. And a lot of, um, I think that there's a, a grand misunderstanding for, you know, um, young people today as well, who do not accept the idea that they are privileged. And I've seen it in youth where they, again, because they may not have had the education to support what privilege actually means, have a difficult time wrapping their head around right have a difficult time with it and yet and yet many of them are not racist either right there's a, a sense of equality right there's a sense of well we come we're you know underneath this color of skin we are really blood and guts and bones and brain right um and on the other hand that's not how it's received if you've never been excluded because of your race or your religion and that brings me to the next topic, which is really the CRN and, and uh, the LGBTQ community, which you're very much a part of. There we are. Look at that. Uh, for those who can't for those who can't see, she's just raised a beautiful bracelet, right? Uh, I mean, really, again, you may be privileged, but you've had to deal with a lot being in that community. Well, to be perfectly honest, Kathy, I haven't, but I have come to know what other people uh, have had to deal with. And it's been an interesting journey for me uh, because I came into this whole thing by accident. It's like everything I do, though. It was an accident I wound up in restorative justice, then an accident I wound up with the Community Response Network stuff. I didn't seek it out. It came to me. As did this, I went to um, a town hall down in Victoria because we have on our board a a woman by the name of Dr. Gloria Gutman, and at that time Gloria was doing a, a research project and series of town halls to talk about LGBTQ, in particular um, older adults and um, and healthcare and uh, services, uh, care, health in the broadest sense of the world. Word. So she came down, and my the powers that be from my agency said I was going to be the one that goes there, and from Island Health the powers that B said Nicole Tremblay was going to be the person who, um, who was going to be there. And Nicole is a clinical educator with uh, Island Health. And we met at that, um, at that particular thing. And I have to say, I walked away thinking, okay, well, glad that's over. Now I can go back up to Nanaimo and uh, get on with, the, you know, with everything I'm already involved in. But the funny thing is that that little coincidence led both of us to thinking, hmm, but there is a problem here. There is an issue around, especially older adults, you know, entering into care, into long-term care or assisted living or whatever, who are LGBTQ, a part of that uh, alphabet soup acronym. And so I found I couldn't ignore it. And Nicole found the same thing. She couldn't ignore it in the context of island health. So... Then there's the fortuitous set of things that happened to me after that. I discovered that a woman living in my complex, and let me be clear, I identify 
uh, not with any of the big letters. I just like, I like the youth term for it, queer. I, what that means is I am not, uh, uh, I am not uh, living a heterosexual life. Right? That's all it means right at this stage of the game, plus a whole complex of other things, right? So, so there was a woman living in my complex who had started a group uh, at Brecon United Church here in Nanaimo uh, called Reaching Out. And I got chatted with Val and then I thought, wow, there's an opportunity here. I want to do an intergenerational project around LGBTQ folks. And, and I met up uh, through the Youth Advocates table with uh, Crimson Coast Dance and Holly Bright, their, uh, their absolutely marvelous, incredible, unbelievably talented director. Absolutely. And we said, we'll do an intergenerational thing. And that's how it all started. So that was five years ago. Amazing, eh? Incredible. And over on her side, Nicole was designing a whole education um, uh, set of modules to train Island Health staff in how to become more affirming and inclusive of LGBTQ. And I, I need to tell you that I've actually taken that training. I had the privilege of taking it rather recently, actually, through Kiwanis. They hosted uh, a fabulous program. And I've got to tell you, everybody should take it. It was so well done and it is so informative. I think that for myself, being that I've worked with seniors for the last six or seven years, what I noted was that LGBT2 community, regardless of how a person self-identifies, they, the older adult had the strength to come out and then this, they had to go back in. And so I think that, that for myself, I found that disheartening that, um, that, that there were members of the community that were facilitating the discomfort of another person who was just living their life, right? And so uh, for me, I think that that was a, an important piece is to, to get people to understand that, that you know, LGBTQ is not a sickness. It's not something that a person needs to hide. It is, it is the way a person is. They're born into whatever that is. And, and again, right in this moment, I sound racist because my lack of education is not even allowing me to present properly. Interesting. But, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, the, the term is so broad. It's, it's, it's alphabet soup, in, in effect, what it is. Uh, so I think, but I think you're absolutely right. The crux of the issue has been in the past that the, through fear, and so this is how it al aligns with racism, uh, lack of privilege, whatever that might be, the fear that if people know who I am, what my true identity is, they won't honor that, right? And there could be abuse, neglect, or anything uh, involved based on that. Uh, uh, based on that fear, wherever it's coming from, uh, you know, in both that person who is afraid of who I am as a person, let's say, yeah. or from me, who is living in fear with my own internalized, yeah. um, uh, you know, issues, whatever those might be. So I guess that, that what we have learned through this is that I, uh, belonging, true belonging cannot happen unless you can be your true person, your authentic person. So what happens when the older adult goes into long-term care, say, and, they, and they're afraid, and they feel they have to hide, is they can't ever belong. So they spend some of the most vulnerable, difficult years of their lives not belonging. And that's not okay. That's what I realized as, uh, as I was watching some of this uh, you know, unfold. That wasn't okay for me, and that is what propelled me into Yep. doing the work that I have been doing with Island Health. Yep. So, and the work, the work you've been doing has really been quite extraordinary. Jane, if you've just tuned, or for everyone in our community, if you've just tuned in, you're listening to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7. That's my dog, Kevin, in the background. The tapping, by the way, if you hear some noises on the background, Jane is in a marvelous speed hand talker. And so if you hear some banging that is happening, part of it is, is just her illustrating the noise on the desk. It is a Zoom call, just so people understand we are not in the studio. So unfortunately, without the editing piece, I can't up and down that. 
So please forgive us for the, the um, for some of the background issues. Uh, having said that, we're super, super glad that you tuned in. Jane Osborne, everybody, is with the BCCRN. At this time in our program, I always recommend people to grab a piece of paper and a pen so that when we come back a little bit later on in conversation, we can give you the details on how you can reach Jane and the CRN. So please feel free to grab yourself a pen and a piece of paper. And in the meantime, we're going to continue our conversation. Jane, I'm how have you seen a change in the way uh, people are supporting older adults or any adult in our community from the alphabet soup perspective? Yes, I'm actually seeing a growing change and uh, I, I feel very encouraged by it because of the fact that we have been working collaboratively you know, both inside our health authority and uh, our service organizations, those that sit around our, our community response network tables, mm -hmm. and working outside more broadly as individuals in community, mm -hmm. we're starting to see some, some real growth, some real shift and some real change. And I'll just use a simple illustration of that. Uh, is, and that illustration is that we were recently, uh, because of the, uh, the community response network in the Cowichan and the community health network that exists down there, mm -hmm. we had the opportunity to say to uh, the, the provider of the new long-term care facility and assisted living going in there, yes. uh, Dave Gutcher from uh, The Hamlets, mm -hmm. which is going in in Duncan, to say, you know, this is very important, uh, you know, that uh, we would really, really want you to be inclusive. And he said, great, I would love to do that. And so as recently as last week, we were able to do a training session with Dave, his new director of care, newly hired, and they're just in the process of hiring staff right now, about, uh, about how to become an affirming and inclusive organization. So it's starting to meet in the middle mm -hmm. so that we're able to be out there. And in that session, we did collaboratively, once again, with Nicole Tremblay from Island Health and Nicole has introduced uh, you know Dave and uh, Barbie to a lot of the tools mm -hmm. and we're going to follow up and do staff training with them and they're excited they want to be inclusive yeah. I think most of us want to be inclusive I agree. but the interesting thing is in a care facility our dominant culture is so pervasive so the Hamlets I love what they've done in terms of designing uh, and talking with the elders uh, from couch and tribes about how they should design how they can make this facility and I'm combining now racism and LGBTQ because you know it's the same thing discrimination that absolutely for any reason right how they can do that and we're also talking about how is it you can be visually welcoming to LGBTQ folks as well you know and I've always been, you know, found it interesting to go into our care facilities and, and look at the walls in, say, the movie room, all covered with pictures of heterosexual couples. Very difficult for, you know, somebody who isn't heterosexual. Yeah, like everything else, we want to see people like us, right? We yeah. always want to see people like us in, in whether it's the movies, sitcoms, all of it. And I noticed that there's a lot more um there there is a lot more on netflix for example of programming that they are designing where those diversity and couples are showing up more more often than not now any of the new programming you'll see at least one couple on their entourage that is you know lesbian or gay or whatever uh whatever term they choose to to use to identify us right i think that that's a problem and i i and i mean you can hear it in me i don't know how to identify uh like i want to say ld lgbtq to spirit i want to say gay i want to say queer i don't know when it's appropriate and i think that many are in the same position how how do you i how do you, how do you educate a community about identifying <laughs> that is part of our education, which essentially is that um, is actually uh, being being curious, yes. without being intrusive. So, <laughs> but what I find interesting, Kathy, is I, I work in a lot in research, uh, uh, allied with uh, research institutions, and it might be UBC, UVic, uh, you know, VIU, whomever, and we are so dominated by gay and lesbian. 
Mm -hmm. And when I see that, the folks that are doing the work are by and large white mm -hmm. and either gay or lesbian. Well, you know, I've got news for the world. If you talk to our youth, you will find out that they don't even identify with those big letters. You know, and I have to admit, I don't either. They identify, you know, as non-binary perhaps. You know, so trying to even understand who a person is and how they want to be addressed, all of those things requires us to be curious and open to yeah. hearing the answers and also providing safety. So if I don't feel safe, whether I'm a youth or whether I'm an older adult, I'm not going to tell, right? I'm not going to reveal my authentic self. So it's really about, well, you get to a point where, you know, I'm curious, uh, you know, how do you prefer to be called? Right? And uh, yeah, and, and, and let them say, you know, because we have a whole world out there of, um, of non cisgendered people, let me put it that way, people who are not, you know, a woman, I'm a woman born in a, you know, a woman's body. And, and that's called cisgender, the same thing with a male born in a male body. There are many people that don't identify from a gender perspective mm -hmm. strongly with either of those genders. And, uh, and they may actually feel they're born in the wrong bodies, which is where trans, uh, you know, they, the word trans comes from, right? And I'll leave it at trans because there's, there's transsexuals and there's trans, never mind, right? <laughs> it all gets complicated. So true. But, you know, then there's all the people that... Um, just feel in between. Two spirit is really an umbrella term in indigenous communities uh -huh. that refers to I am somewhere on a variety of different continuums. Yes. The gender continuum, the sexuality continuum, whatever that continuum might be, I'm somewhere, but I'm not at one end or the other. Exactly. And that's where the term non binary came from. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And why we have to use a plus. Because we don't use the plus, we're going to miss something because it keeps growing and changing. Which makes sense if you understand that that's the define, that the plus means, and there may be others, there may be another to come. Mm -hmm. I know that recently, I'm, for many people know that I've been in education for almost 30 years, and I continue to do that, although through my work now, I'm predominantly in community um, and working with older adults. But for years, I, I was a, a teacher and still continue to do so. And what I've noticed in new, um, new um, surname, or sir, I, uh, salutation prior to name, like miss, mrs, I've lost the actual, actual term. Ms. <laughs> that used to be Ms. when I, I was growing up. And I was Ms. for years. So the new at the latest is to be non, non-sexual period, neither female nor male. And so the new salutation is MX. MX, oh, that's a good one. MX, and so you will begin to see dear MX, Donna Wilson or dear MX Doug, you know, Jones. So, and, and I feel really comfortable with that because I never, I never felt comfortable with Miss, Mrs. Ms. I became Ms. after my divorce, right? And then when I got remarried and then divorced again, I kept Ms. all the way through because I didn't want to identify as somebody, somebody, right? For me, it was just more comfortable to still remain as an independent person, even though I may have taken the last name of my, of my spouse. And so I think that what we need to, and what we recognize too, is that when people are identifying their gender, you know, I, it was a first for me in the training at Kiwanis to hear I refer to myself as she, in the pronoun, she, um, I, she, and her are the, pro, the personal pronouns. So, you know, I think that people need to identify with that as well. And that's why it gets so confusing is that people in their genuine desire to be respectful and to learn and to be open and to try to be inclusive, find themselves going, oh, I don't know how to identify. What do I say? What do I do? Right? It's really, really hard um, to not, especially when you're wanting to be so inclusive. Yes, absolutely true, Kathy. <laughs> you know, it's a, I find that very interesting because I think that uh, for me, I, you know, being, I think I'm, I'm in my 74th year now. Yes. Oh my God. You're I'll be close to into my 75th in, in November. But uh, yeah, I had no idea that you were in your 70s. 
Yeah, nope. there you go. Um, <laughs> I look like, you know, a grandma, right? You don't look like a grandma. I actually, to be honest with you, thought you were in your late 50s, early 60s. I thought you were maybe a couple years older than I am. Well, there you go. Not so, Kathy. Skincare. But, uh, <laughs> it's really a wonderful learning. Uh, you know, I've been through this wonderful learning experience, you know, with the trying to understand where I came from. But I know that when I first joined IBM, and that was back in 1966, so that was a while ago, just having completed That's university. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were required to wear skirts. And we were required to do this and do that. And the men had to wear suits, white shirts and ties. And it was a very rigid structure. And feminism was just beginning to blossom at that time. And I can remember leading the charge for, you know, not wanting to conform to any of that. And at that time, I was in a heterosexual relationship. Uh, as many, uh, you know, as many uh, folks that later in life decided that wasn't what they wanted. Absolutely. Many of us, Absolutely. you know, married, uh, you know, kids, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so anyhow, what I remember is the charge for feminism. And to this day, I'm still uh, wrestling with male privilege. And by that, I mean, I was in a unit where when I was one of, I think, three or four, maybe five women across Canada at that time in a senior um, systems analyst or systems engineer position, right? And women were supposed to be receptionists, secretaries. Uh, you know, there's this long list of things that women were supposed to be. So I have all my life been fighting against the orthodoxy or the assumptions that we make about people based on skin color, gender, education, uh, faith tradition, all of these other things create these stereotypical, uh, stereotypical views we have of the universe. So when you start to get into LGBTQ, da, 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 uh, wow, you know, it's a very interesting experience because it, everything gets thrown out the window. <laughs> Indeed. And yet it, it, everything. And it does, but in a way it doesn't because it really is the same fight, really, if you think about it. I mean, do not misunderstand. I am a feminist. I'm also a very feminine woman. I am without a doubt a girly girl. I like rhinestones. I like curly hair. I like, you know, eyelashes that go from here to Manitoba and my red lipstick is my favorite. So I am a very girly girl and I'm a feminist. So, and I think that, that for some generations as well, feminine, feminism means that you have to be someone who is more, um, I hate to say this word, but more butchy, right? More masculine in their thoughts, which is complete and total crap. Once again, it's about the define, right? So, and, and I, I, as an English teacher, it's been really a challenge for me not to throw up my Webster's dictionary because most of the definitions in Webster's do not match what really the definition is by the people who live in that way right and whether it's as a feminist i i do not feel in any way that being a feminine woman means that i cannot have values that support women in power and understanding why we do what we do i also do not believe that you know that that when it comes to um any community regardless of the color or the religion or the background or the socioeconomic status I, I guess I'm struggling with the whole idea of who the hell do we all think we are that we can put the judgment on other people. And I've never been able to reconcile that, Jane. Never. Right? Okay. So I'm with you there, Kathy. So in other words, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we, we get a stereotypical idea of feminist. And in fact, many feminists hold that stereotypical idea and they want to exclude those of us who just can't line up with that idea. And I, can, I never could. I could never line up with anything, actually because I'm just a natural rebel, right? Yes, you are. <laughs> Somebody's saying, go go north, I'll go south, you know, whatever. Uh, it's just natural to me to do that. So, that's so. A that is a blessing because what it does is it provides the ability for you to have insight into what someone else might be experiencing. And that opens it up for further dialogue and further conversation. Without you, Jane, I mean, I have to tell you, I will never forget, and I have respected you from this I mean, for a long time, but there was one I will never forget. And I told people this story about you specifically a thousand times, right? I just, it's my favorite thing. 
And I remember being very frustrated. You and I were in a deep heated conversation and it had to do with better at home and, and it had to do with a bunch of stuff that was going on in my community. And you said, Kathy, you don't know what you don't know. I was so pissed off. I was like, what the heck? Who do you think you are? Don't you tell me. And I was mad, boy, was I mad. And you know what? You were so right. You were so right that to this day, I've written about it in my magazine at Nanaimo Voyager magazine many times, that phrase, and where it originally came from. I actually have an article dedicated to you. I don't even know if you've ever read it. Um, just seriously, because the reality is, is the fact that you don't follow that, you don't follow that, you know, beaten path. You tend to go off on the roads untraveled. You bring an insight to the conversation at every level and all of the time. And I'm so grateful for it. You know, in all the years I've known you, um, I, I only grow to respect you more and more by the day, by the minute. You just inspire me. So I just wanted to share that with you and our community as a whole. Hey, if you've just tuned in, I just want you to know you are listening to Act 3 on CHLY 101.7 in beautiful Nanaimo and all over Vancouver Island. I am Kathy Holmes. I, I'm fabulously so fortunate to be able to be the host of this program and to have incredible guests like Jane Osborne, who is with the BCCRN and any number of tables uh, for influence within our community. Jane, how do people reach you? If they want to if they want to, you know, find out more about some of the things we've talked about today, how do they contact you? Well, if they're, uh, if they have email, I'm really attentive to email and, you know, I will always respond. It is jane.osborne, O-S-B-O-R-N-E at B-C-C-R-N-S dot C-A. Can you repeat that one more time, please? Would you mind repeating yes. that one more time? Jane dot Osborne, O S B O R N E, at B C C R N S dot C A. That's S B C C R N S for short dot C A. And by telephone, you can reach me on my mobile because I do travel a lot and I'm mostly not here at, in my home office. And that number, you know, and text works really well. And I'm, I'm, the youth have taught me how to text. 604-363-5370. And that's a Vancouver number, but it's still, you know, people are able to get your text just so they know. So that's 604-363-5370, correct? That's correct, yes. We're just about at the end of the program. We only have a couple of minutes left. I can't believe how fast this show went. I still have so many more questions for you, Jane, and so much more I want to talk to you about, which means that you'll have to come back. That's just the way it's going to have to be. But for now, you know, if you were to do, if you were to, to give someone a takeaway, like that moment of, oh, that life lesson, what might that look like to you, Jane? It would probably look like don't assume anything about anybody uh, because you have a very great chance of being wrong. And the reason I say that is because we all have built a number of uh, stereotypes and ideas by the way we were brought up, where we were brought up. And we often will look at people through that lens. So be curious, right? Ask people to share you know, their story or who they are with you. Don't assume. I have been hoisted on that petard to use the Shakespearean time so many times. I used to have a boss who said to me, uh, assume, oh, that stands for make an ass out of you and me. You betcha. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on that for sure. Assume that okay. you make an ass of you and me and you don't know what you don't know. Just say it. Okay. <laughs> Works for me. Works for me too. Thank you so much for being on the program today, Jane. I just, you know, I, again, I'm so grateful that you have been able to share your insight and your wisdom with our community, with Vancouver Island as a whole, uh, and with, uh, you know, the Act 3 television program, which is coming soon to Shaw Spotlight. Thank you, Jane, for your time today. Any closing thoughts? No, except that I'm, I'm blushing, but you may not be able to tell. <laughs> But I've come to know you, Kathy, if you're, you're larger than life. 
Oh, right? That's, that's just Kathy Holmes. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. It's like I said, it's great to have you on the program. And and I just I look forward to the next things that you're going to be teaching our community walking ahead. So thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Act Three. Once again, you can find us at www Act Three Media Productions.com. It's a work in progress, but nonetheless, the beginning of our website is there. You will also soon be able to find us on Shaw Spotlight. Not sure, but it will be all over Vancouver Island. Absolutely. And certainly, you hopefully will be able to have this recording up on the website shortly. Tune in every Monday at one o'clock for Act Three. Thanks again for tuning in and have a great day, everybody.